Ann Taylor from Yale. She can tell us about stability and mapping class groups and regular orders. Okay. Uh, thank you for the invitation to speak, and thank you all for coming. Uh, so as Spencer said, I'm going to talk about this notion of stability. And so there are sort of two parts to this talk. Uh, the first part, uh, the main goal is to sort of introduce the notion, or, or introduce what it means for a finitely generated group to be stable inside of another finitely generated group. And, and the motivation for the original motivation for this definition comes from the study of convex co-compact subgroups of the mapping class group. So I'll spend sort of the first half of the talk at least giving a sort of partial introduction to convex co-compact subgroups of mapping class groups and sort of say what they have to do with stability. So that's the first part. And the second part is um, giving a sort of complete characterization of what stable subgroups are of right angle learning groups. And so the reason we're doing the first part is to introduce stability, but also because the situation of within right angle learning groups is very closely connected to um, the situation of mapping class groups. So that, that's what I hope to talk about. OK, so as I said, we're going to start off with sort of giving what the idea of stability is, and we want to motivate it with, with mapping class groups. So let's um, we'll fix a surface of genus closed surface, closed orientable surface of genus at least two. And we'll denote by mod s its mapping class group. OK. So um, the notion of convex co-compact subgroups of mapping class groups was introduced by Farb and Mosher in, in, in 2001, in part to study hyperbolic extensions of surface groups. So I, I want to tell you, I want to sort of tell you what that story is. Okay, so there's the following well-known short exact sequence, the Berman exact sequence for the mapping class group, where this is the fundamental group of the surface. Um, the details of this aren't important. What's important is for any um, finitely generated, for any subgroup of the mapping class group, I get a corresponding, I get a course, it's gamma, I get a corresponding extension of the surface group simply by pulling it back through this short exact sequence. Okay, so I have some homomorphism P, and what I could do is I could simply take the preimage, take the preimage through this homomorphism P, and what I get is I get a new extension of the surface group. So this is sort of a, a geometric way of seeing what the extensions of surface groups are. And the question, one of the questions I'm interested in, this is the question that Farb and Mosher wanted to uh, investigate, is when is the extension group E gamma hyperbolic? Right, so the point is I take any subgroup of the mapping class group. Using this exact sequence, I could pull it back to get an extension of the surface group. And I'm interested in the geometric properties of the extension group. In particular, when is it a hyperbolic group? So hyperbolic in, in the sense of Kuramali. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is show you how this sort of motivating question leads us to a whole bunch of different equivalent characterizations of um, what are called convex co-compact subgroups of mapping class groups. So I'm going to state a theorem. And really, it, it's, a, it's a rather big theorem that I'll attribute to a different sets of people. So this is combining a bunch of people's work. So this is the original Farb Mosher paper. This is a work of Kent Leininger and work of Hammerstadt. Okay. So the theorem is going to be sort of the answer, some sort of answer to this question. When is the corresponding extension hyperbolic? Okay, and it goes like this. So let H be some finitely generated subgroup of the mapping class group. Okay. And the point is the following are equivalent. Okay. So I'm going to give you the equivalent conditions. I'm going to tell you, so, this, so the equivalent conditions, they'll, um, when H satisfies one of them, we'll say it's convex co-compact. So the first condition is uh, H is convex co-compact. So one implies the other is, is, is the definition. This is going to be the definition. Okay, two. So the, the point of this is I'm going to the point of this is to see a whole bunch of different equivalent conditions that imply hyperbolicity of the extension. So some of the terms might not be so familiar and, and they won't be defined, but the point is just to see all the different ways um, one can characterize this notion in terms of the geometry of the surface. 
So condition two is Farb and Mosher's, one of their original definitions is, um, so let x be some point in the Teichmuller space of s. Okay. Uh, then the orbit, so of course the mapping class group acts on the Teichmuller space of s, and I can look at the orbit inside of Teichmuller space, and I want it to be quasi-convex. And this is with respect to the Teichmuller metric. Okay. So it's some condition two is some geometric notion using the action of the mapping class group on Teichmuller space. Three is going to be using the geometry of the action of the mapping class group on, on the curve complex. So maybe I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about these things um, in a few moments. So we'll let alpha be a curve on the surface, so it's a vertex of the curve graph. And the condition is the orbit map from H to the curve graph, right, and orbit maps are given by this, is a quasi-asymmetric embedding. So this is a condition involving the geometry of the curve graph, the action of the mapping class group on the curve, gra curve graph. And the point is, the point using the sort of corresponding to this motivation is that the extension EH is hyperbolic. Okay. okay, so what are we supposed to take away from this theorem that combines uh, lots of people's work? It's that there's a notion, convex co-compactness, for finitely generated subgroups of the mapping class group that will tell us when the corresponding extension, sort of defined as like this, when the corresponding extension is hyperbolic. And that we could characterize that condition in terms of uh, various notions that are related to the geometry of the surface. So condition two characterizes it in terms of um, what's going on in the Teichmuller space. So you required that this orbit is quasi-convex. And condition three characterizes it in terms of the action on the curve graph. So the point is. Um, well, what by itself can already imply that, uh, that gamma is hyperbolic as well, right? Certainly, yeah. So that will be one of my basic observations I'll, I'll say next. That's right. But so do two and three. <laughs> um, right. so, so this is, so this is sort of. Um, convex co-compactness. This is, this is sort of the concept we're interested in uh, from my point of view really because I, I like this hyperbolic extension uh, criteria. Okay, so the notion of stability sort of was, was it came out of the fact that sort of we could characterize convex co-compactness, okay, in terms of the geometry of Teichmuller space, the geometry of the curve graph, or the geometry of these ex surface group extensions. Um, Matt Durham and I wanted a condition uh, wanted to sort of write down the condition that was determining sort of the notion of convex co-compactness just in terms of the geometry of the mapping class group. So that's where we're headed. We want to write down an equivalent condition just using the geometry of the mapping class group. Because once we do that, it's going to be a group theoretic condition. And so it's going to be a condition that we can apply to lots of other settings. Okay, and sort of I'm going to try to motivate why you want to study this notion of convex co-compactness in other groups other than mapping class groups. Okay? So that's going to be this, this sort of stability. But first, let's sort, of, let's sort of stick with this for another minute. Um, so I want to observe two facts and then ask two questions, still about convex co-compactness of, of mapping class groups. So here's some facts. Um, so one is that if H is convex co-compact uh, and I have some element of H, so it's some mapping class that has infinite order, okay, then what does condition three say? So I didn't describe this, I didn't sort of give details here. But what it says is I take some curve, I iterate that curve under F, and in this complex I'm supposed to be going to infinity. That's what it means. That is implied by it being a quasi-asymmetric embedding. In particular, if I take my mapping class and I iterate it on a simple closed curve, that curve never comes back to itself. 
right? So in particular, uh, f is a pseudo and also mapping class. So fact one is just if I have a convex co-compact subgroup, then every infinite order element is, is, is pseudo and also. So if you don't know the definition of pseudo and also, right, just take it to mean sort of um, no positive power of it fixes any simple closed curve, isotopy class of simple closed curve on the surface. It's a direct consequence of three. It's a consequence of all of them, but okay. Um, two, it's exactly what Ilya said. Uh, if H is convex co-compact, then uh, H is hyperbolic. So you could see that with four, I guess, using like the fact that there's a quasi-symmetric. Yeah, you could see that with four. The easiest way to see that is with three. Yeah, you can see that with three. Um, so I'm not doing a very good job of introducing these as concepts. But sort of the curve complex is, is, is a very important object in the study of um, surface topology. And it's a very big result of Mazur and Minsky that this graph is a hyperbolic graph. Okay. And condition three is that H, the subgroup of the mapping class group, quasi-isometrically embeds into a hyperbolic graph. In particular, the group itself is, is hyperbolic. Okay, so, we, so we get that condition, or that, that fact. Okay, so these are just two sort of elementary facts that follow from the assumption of convex co-compactness. Okay. So kind of using these two facts, I want to ask two questions. So these are you know, fairly, these are big open questions in the field. These are questions that you know, I'm very interested in. Okay, so questions. So question one is, so here's this basic fact, right? We have the strong condition of convex co-compactness. We, we characterize it in lots of different ways. In particular, we have this fact one that every infinite order element has to be pseudo on Asaf. Okay. Question one is, does the converse hold? Okay. Um, yeah. So suppose I have some finitely generated subgroup of the mapping class group. And every element, let's say every element, every non-identity element is pseudo and also. The question is, is H convex co-compact? So I'm not going to do a great job of motivating these questions either, um, mainly because we'll see in a, in, in a minute I want to sort of try to generalize them to, this, to other finitely generated groups. But sort of answers to this, an answer to this question has sort of important consequences for other areas of, of geometric group theory. As does this question. So the next question is really just asking what types of groups can these convex co-compact subgroups of mapping class groups be? Okay. So question is there a subgroup of the mapping class group that's convex co-compact such that, so I'm asking a special case of a more general question. H is isomorphic to the fundamental group of a closed surface. So the question is, can you have surface subgroups, convex co-compact surface subgroups of mapping class groups? Okay. Questions make sense? So we're going to come back and sort of want to kind of generalize these questions later to other finitely generated groups. Okay. So in order to do that, I need to come up with a notion of convex co-compactness in other finitely generated groups. Okay. So this is, this is the picture of what's going on inside of the mapping class group. But the point now is, as I said, we're trying to motivate this notion of stability. And what I want to do is give a characterization of convex co-compactness that just uses the geometry of the mapping class group okay, in such a way that sort of the definition should apply to any, you know, should make sense in any finitely generated group. OK, so let's, let's start introducing that idea. OK, so really, so this so I'm going to give the definition of stability. Um, so really, this is also meant to be sort of the obvious generalization of a quasi-convex subgroup of a hyperbolic group. So um, in the study of hyperbolic groups, it's sort of become very One sort of important way one can try to understand the hyperbolic group is to understand its quasi-convex subgroups. 
However, it's sort of well known that the notion of quasi-convexity is not so nice when, when the group is not hyperbolic. Okay, it, it, in particular, it depends on a choice of generating set. Um, what I'm going to write down, this definition of stability, is really just the most simple-minded definition one could write down, uh, sort of gets rid of the dependence on the generating set. It makes the notion of quasi-convexity a QI invariant. So really, there's nothing special here in this, this definition. It's just, um, you just have to write it down. OK, so here it is. So let H uh, be some finitely generated subgroup of a finitely generated group G. Okay. Then H is stable in G, so this is the definition of stability, which, which I write H stab G uh, if. So there are two conditions. One is that H is undistorted in G. Right? And, and recall, all this means is that the inclusion map, so pick, pick your favorite generating sets on H and G, and all this means is that the inclusion map from H into G is a QI embedding. Okay. So it's undistorted. And the second condition, which is sort of the much more restrictive condition, is that, so I'll just tell you, quasi-geodesics that begin and end on H are forced to fellow travel. But we have to quantify that. So for all L, there exists an R such that if gamma 1 and gamma 2 are L quasi-geodesics, in G with common endpoints uh, on H, on the subgroup, then they have you know, bounded Hausdorff distance. So gamma 1 is contained in an R neighborhood of gamma 2, and gamma 2 is contained in an R neighborhood of gamma 1. Okay, so I'll draw a picture to say what I mean by that. Uh, I'm sorry, say that. Once it's true for what? Uh, so the condition. So the condition involves putting uh, having some word norm on H and G, but once it's true for one of them, it's true for all of them. Yeah. It's a QI invariant. Yeah, that will be another observation. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But that's exactly right. So that's why. So th this is. I mean, this is almost the same thing as quasi convexity. The only difference in the definition is I use quasi geodesics instead of geodesics, and, and the importance there is if I you know change the generating set. The set of quasi-geodesics doesn't change, but the set of geodesics changes. Okay. Okay. So, here, um, right, so here's the picture, right? If I was going to tell you what it meant to be quasi-convex in tight Euler space, I, I would draw the same picture. So in this case, so here's here's G. Here's my subgroup H. It's undistorted. And if I take two points, you know, I connect them by two different quasi-geodesics. Right, so they don't, they fellow travel, they don't get too far away from each other. Okay. So it's sort of some sort of strong, it's a strong fellow traveling property for quasi-geodesics that begin and end on H. Okay. Well, a known example would be like a diagonal subgroup is equal to G. That's right, yeah. That's exactly right. Okay. Okay, so facts. There's just very, very basic facts that directly from the definition, okay? Just to sort of get us a feel for what this is saying. So the first fact is, if G is hyperbolic, uh, then I haven't done anything. This is, this is exactly the notion of quasi-convexity. So H stab G, if and only if H is quasi-convex in G. Okay, so in the... G itself is hyperbolic. This is the same notion as quasi-convexity, so, which is what I wanted. Two, what's two? Yeah, okay, so H stab G is, is independent of the generating sets. So I'll just say is a QI invariant. I said this is exactly what Ilya was saying. Three. Um, wait, okay, so H 
fab g implies that h itself is hyperbolic. Okay. This is sort of fairly straightforward. The point is, I'm requiring quasi-geodesics of g that begin and end on common endpoints of h to fellow travel. And because, but because h is undistorted, that in particular forces all quasi-geodesics in h to fellow travel. And in any geodesic metric space, if you have uh, fellow traveling quasi-geodesics properly quantified, uh, the, the space is hyperbolic. Okay. Um, four is that h sub g. This implies that, I mean, this is such a strong property, it actually implies that h is quasi-convex with respect to any generating set. The definition of quasi convexity or stability doesn't see the difference between different generating sets. Is there a converse to that theory? Uh, I don't, it's hard to say like when a metric comes from a word norm. I, I don't know. I think it might be accidentally false. Okay. If you're quasi convex with respect to every QI metric, then you're stable. But actually, formulating what the converse of this is seems more subtle. And G is more quasi subtle. convex inside of G with respect to any metric. Right. But it's not going to be stable on every one. <laughs> that's right. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Oh, OK. Same thing with finite index subgroups as well. Good. OK. Yeah, so the actually, yeah. So the reason, that's good. So <laughs> the, reason, the reason it's um, we're acquiring. The reason we're requiring quasi-geodesics to fellow travel and not to fellow travel each other and not just fellow travel H is to get rid of things like that. Make sure that sort of finite index subgroups aren't trivially stable. Good point. Uh, and five, five isn't really a fact. It's just that uh, this notion is already sort of well studied in the case where H is cyclic. So, so this is a kind of a definition. If H is cyclic, it's generated by one element. Then stability, if this thing is stable in G, then H is a Morse element. So this is the definition. So a Morse, the notion of Morse elements is sort of a well-studied notion in, in geometric group theory. And it's a, equivalent to being stable uh, when you, so a, a Morse element, an element's Morse, if and only if the cyclic subgroup generated by it is stable. OK, so this is the notion of stability. And what's this have to do with? Well, what's this have to do with the original motivation? I claim sort of we were after um, a group theoretic characterization of convex co-compactness. So that led us to the, um, this definition because of the following theorem. So this is, this is joint with Matt Durham. It's that H is, so H is subgroup in the mapping class group, is convex co-compact if and only if it's stable. Right, so this isn't meant to be a surprising theorem or anything. It, it's meant to be the characterization, the correct characterization in terms of the geometry of the mapping class group. Right, so again it's, it's, again, it's sort of a quasi-convexity property. Just here in the notion of, um, the non-hyperbolicity of the mapping class group you need. This is sort of the notion of quasi-convexity that you need. So in the Klein group, convex space is the same in case three. Yeah. Okay. Something is parabolic if it's geometrically finite in the ordinary sense, but it doesn't contain the group piece. So it's not just uh, it's only a parabolic subgroup of cyclic. Mm -hmm. uh, would that be? Uh, no, it won't be stable. No, no. You need you, all of your elements. If you're stable, then all of your elements are loxodromic. Oh, oh, oh. Um, yeah, so I mean, in the situation of Kleinian groups, right, it, um, then it, it, sort of the same situation is being within a hyperbolic group. So sort of stability is quasi-convexity there, which is convex co-compactness in the Kleinian group sense. Okay. okay, so that was kind of the first part of the talk, right? So this is the so motivation. Is, so I guess you're saying that this, this, this is also true in, in the convex mm -hmm. 
subject of science, right? Yeah. Uh, so that's a little bit more subtle. So if you're talking about subgroups of a fixed Kleinian group, then yes, this is true, but that's more subtle and not written down, right? Because then your Kleinian group could have parabolics, okay. and you need to talk about stable subgroups of a relatively hyperbolic group, and that's that's more subtle. But that's it's still true. It's still true. Yeah. But in general, characterizing stable subgroups of relatively hyperbolic groups. Is, um, is is subtle because it depends what the peripheral subgroups are. But in the case of climbing groups, it, okay. okay. So here here are the questions, right? So these are questions that I said are important questions in in um, the situation of the mapping class group. So what I want to do is I want to ask these questions in other finitely generated groups, um, and I'll, I'll try to motivate why I think this is interesting in, in a second. But first, let's just ask the questions. Um, so first. First, maybe I'll have a one prime. Um, so I'll erase, I'll erase where the mapping class group appears. Okay, so first, the setup for the questions is let G be finitely generated. Okay, and, and the first question you could ask is, what are the stable subgroups? Of G, and, and and sort of the real question is how, how can we how can we detect them? Right. The point is we now in the mapping class group stable subgroups are the convex co-compact subgroups, and we wrote down a whole uh, list of different uh, equivalent notions of convex co-compactness. So, for instance, using this this one. Um, a bullet point that was proven by Ken and Leininger and independently Hammenstein, the stable subgroups of the mapping class group are exactly the subgroups that go QI into this hyperbolic graph, the curve graph. I would like to know whether there's some sort of a notion like that that you could sort of detect stable subgroups in other finitely generated groups by studying what subgroups uh, have quasi-asymmetric embeddings into, into hyperbolic graphs. OK, so let's talk, let's talk about the generalizations of these questions. OK, so suppose I have some finitely generated subgroup of G, and each non-identity element is Morse. Right, so this, this really means right, the cyclic subgroup generated by it is stable. Okay. The question, does that make H stable? Okay. So I think of this as sort of a local to global question. I have a finitely generated subgroup. And I know each non-identity element itself is stable, it is Morse. Does that imply that the entire subgroup is stable? Uh, the question written like this is, is the answer is no. Um, there are easy examples why the answer is no. There are, so if G is hyperbolic, if G is a hyperbolic group, any non-quasi-convex subgroup will, will violate, will be a, a, a no answer to this question. We'll provide a, an example of a, the no answer to this question. However, what I'm really interested in is for what groups G it, does this question have an affirmative answer? Right? That's exactly the question that was there before in the situation of the mapping class group. In the mapping class group, you could ask this question. It's exactly the question that appeared before. And now I'm, I'm interested in what groups G, is it true that I have this local to global property? So I'll, I'll refer to this as local to global. So I'll say it again because it's kind of jumbled on the board now. <laughs> the local to global property is or H has a local to global, or G has the local to global property, is if I have a finitely generated subgroup and every element, non-identity element of it is stable, does that imply that the entire subgroup is stable? Okay. So that's the question in the mapping class group, and I'm interested in um, for what groups is this true? The second question, which I'll have to erase because I'll say does there exist H stable in G with H isomorphic to something interesting, like a closed surface group. Okay. So that, again, this is the same question that was there before, just now asked in the 
the more general setting of other finally generated groups. Okay. So these are three questions I'm interested in. Unders it's really just understanding stability in, in finally generated groups. Um, Which one? Why is one? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So the question is for, for what G do we have? For what G do we have stable subgroups? What are the stable subgroups for a given G? And can we find G for which the, there are stable subgroups that are isomorphic to closed surface groups? Okay. Or can we find G for which local to global property holds? So, I mean, it, right. So you, you, if, you pick, if you pick a free abelian group, the answer is easy. The answer is no for everything. There are no stable subgroups of a free abelian group. Sure, sure. Or, pick, or more importantly, maybe pick your, pick your favorite geometrically interesting group, like the mapping class group, or an outer automorphism group of a free group, or a right angle arting group, and, and ask these questions in those settings. So, it, I mean, in the situation of the mapping class group, these are the questions that I had on the board before, and they're, they're outstanding open questions that have interesting implications to, to other areas of geometric group theory and topology. So, so, So the answer is so that there are no surface subgroups. So that was proven by Chris, Chris Leininger. So there, there aren't stable surface subgroups of right angle iron groups. So one reason it's interesting, um, and maybe this was going to be motivation I was going to talk about in, in a little bit. Um, yeah, I'll say it now, even though I was going to say it in a little bit. So in particular, in the situation of right angle iron groups, there are several constructions of embedding right angle Arden groups in the mapping class groups. So um, maybe the one that I'm most familiar with and is most useful in this context is a situation that implies or constructs quasi-isometric embeddings of right angle Arden groups into mapping class groups. So this is due to Clay, Leininger, and then Gahas. The point is to use, so this is a quasi-isometric embedding, and in particular, stability pulls back through quasi-asymmetric embeddings. So the point is to use um, knowledge of stable subgroups of right angle Arden groups to then show that through these quasi-asymmetric embeddings, you get convex co-compact subgroups of mapping class groups. And this was actually done by uh, Johanna Mangahas and myself um, with the, the result being something like, so suppose this map is phi. And this is one of the homomorphisms that was constructed by Clay Leininger and Mangahas. Our result says that if, well, actually combining our result with the main result I'm about to get to in this talk, uh, says that if I take a subgroup of this right angle iron group such that its image in the mapping class group is purely pseudo on Asav, every element is pseudo on Asav, then the image is actually convex co-compact. So in particular, convex co-compactness in the right angle learning group, or stability in the right angle learning group setting, because sort of we have these quasi-asymmetric embeddings that really reflect where we could sort of understand the image using the cubical geometry of the right angle learning group really allows us to say something in this case about convex co-compact subgroups and mapping class groups. And so the question in right angle learning groups is, is closely related to the question in the mapping class groups using, using these embeddings. Um, is that okay? You're right. So I mean, if you pick a, a random group and ask for the stable subgroups, it's probably meaningless. So but in other settings, that well, yeah. But so the, the rest of the talk will be about answering it in the right angle learning group situation. Right. So in, in the, the point is in the mapping class group situation, it's relatively it's. Well, I mean, so for example, you mean what have I done so far? What's that? Yeah, I think. I, yeah, I think the class of right angle is. I think it's. I think it's not as simple to state what you would you expect to be the answer. What are the stable subgroups of relatively hyperbolic groups? I can't. I mean, you could ask what are the stable subgroups of the outer automorphism group of the free group, and I think that I think that's an interesting question, and I think it's related to hyperbolic extensions of free groups. Um, or uh, no, there, so there will be no stable subgroups of higher rank lattices. 
I think so. I think there are no cut points and they're asymptotic. They don't have any Morse elements. Or it oh. stated with the correct conditions on the higher rank lattices. It's known that they have, for instance, linear divergence. And so So let's, let's, let's talk about right angle iron groups. And maybe there's more of a philosophical point here that sort of these are the subgroups that we sort of analyze using sort of the tools of hyperbolic geometry. And so, um, if we have a group that we're, that we're interested in, it's sort of, um, it sort of makes sense to at least try to see if sort of there are subgroups we could analyze in this sort of way. Um, okay. All right, so let's just talk a bit about right angle iron groups. All right, so the point maybe was that the situation is, um, because of these open questions, it's sort of difficult to analyze in the situation in the mapping class group. And what I'm going to give you now is sort of, in the right angle iron group case, we have a sort of a complete characterization of what the state of the subgroups are. Um, and in particular, so I already said that sort of, Chris has a result that says we're not going to be able to use right angle iron groups to find convex co-compact uh, surface subgroups in, in mapping class groups. So even though um, right angle iron groups give us lots of quasi-symmetric embeddings into mapping class groups, we can't use them to actually find convex compact surface groups. I'm going to have a similar statement that tells us that we, we can't also we also can't use it to find a counterexample to the local to global question in the mapping class group. So that's also some sort of motivation for for, for what we do here. Okay. So I'm going to I'm recycling notation a bit. So let gamma be a finite simplicial graph. Okay. So I'm just defining what, it, what a right angle learning group is. The right angle learning group on gamma is a group with the following presentation. So there's a generator for each vertex of gamma. And I have a relator saying that two generators commute if and only if. Uh, the corresponding vertices uh, form an edge. Okay. So a very simple definition of what a right angle iron group is. Uh, so if you haven't seen this before, here are a couple of examples. Um, so the right angle iron group on a complete graph on five vertices, it's five generators and they all commute. So it's the free abelian group of rank five. If I just have five disjoint vertices, then it's five generators with no relators. It's the free group of rank five. And, and just to see that sort of right angle iron groups can be sort of more complex than these two examples, I can also take the right angle iron group on a graph that's the pentagon. And this contains a closed surface group of genus two, so more complex structure. And so, so I think this was first observed by Crisp and Wiest. Okay. So three examples. Um, the goal is sort of to talk about the stable subgroups of right angle learning groups. So really, we need to say something about the geometry of these right angle learning groups. And I'll just Maybe brief, briefly mention two objects. One of which I'm not really going to define in detail. Um, so the right angle learning group acts on what's sometimes called the universal cover of the Salvetti complex, which for this talk we'll just say it, it acts, um, I guess I'll say geometrically. on this cat zero Q complex. Okay. So 
we'll, we'll come back to this action in a bit. Okay, there's another space that it acts on. So this is going to be sort of an analog of the curve graph. So I'll define this. So this is defined by Kim and Coberta. Really, it's just to study some geometric and algebraic features of right angle learning groups. So this is the extension graph. Okay. So I, I'll tell you what this is. So the vertices. Okay, so right now I'm defining this graph. I'll call it the extension graph. And so to define a graph, I need to tell you what the vertices and the edges are. So the vertices are conjugates of standard generators. So the standard generators are the generators given by the vertices of the graph. So the vertices of the extension graph are conjugates of those standard generators. And the edges, well, I have x joined to y, where x and y are, are vertices, if and only if x and y commute. Okay. So of course, I'm blurring the distinction between vertices of the graph and the, and the generators they correspond to in the group. So I have two different actions, action on the universal cover of the Salvetti complex, and I also have sort of this obvious action on this extension graph, right, where the action is given by conjugation by the, of the vertices. Okay, so before I get to the actual characterization of stability, I want to tell you what the, the Morse elements are. I want to tell you what the individual stable elements are. Okay, so these are. So this extension graph is the mobility group? Yeah, so, yeah, so I didn't give any properties of it. So this was proven. Um, so, except in a, a, a few exceptional cases. So, let's, for simplicity, let's suppose this graph is connected and the complement graph is also connected. So, that means the, the graph given by replacing. Um, the graph sort of taking the complete subgraph on the same set of generators and removing the edges corresponding to, to the edges in gamma. Both of those graphs are connected. Um, in that case, this is uh, connected. The extension graph is connected. It's infinite diameter, and it's actually quasi-symmetric to a tree. So in particular, it's a type of hop. Okay. So what I'd like to do now is to tell you what the loxodromic elements of this group are. So what's the analog? So I'm in a right angle learning group. What's the analog of a pseudo Anasov element? So here's a theorem. And it's combining work of a bunch of people again. Um, but I'll just state the, state the theorem. Um, so for G in the right angle learning group, um, the following are equivalent. One is that G uh, acts loxodromically on the extension graph. Remember what it it means. What it means to act loxodromically means it has positive stable translation length. Okay. Two, uh, G is a rank one isometry. of this cat zero Q complex. Okay. So it's okay if you sort of are unfamiliar with some of these terms of giving a bunch of equivalent definitions. Sort of that for me are the analog of being pseudo Anasov in the right angle learning group. Uh, three G, the cyclic subgroup generated by G is stable. Four, let me also give one more. Um, so the last one's going to be an algebraic property. The centralizer of G is cyclic. Okay. All right, so for G satisfying these conditions, we'll say that G is loxodromic. Okay, so now I can tell you what the main theorem is. And it answers the second question that I just erased in the right angle learning group situation. Um, the 
Thomas Goberta, Johanna Mangahas, myself. Um, how do I want to state it? Yeah, okay. So as always, let H be some finitely generated subgroup of right angle iron group. Uh, then the following are equivalent. Um, right, the first one is that H is stable in the right angle iron group. The second one is that the orbit map from H into the extension graph is a QI embedding. So I guess these, these two, the equivalence of these two is not so surprising. It's sort of similar to what was going on in the mapping class group situation. The, the third one. You're not thinking on something about gamma with the first infinity pair? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. So gamma is, gamma is connected and anti-connected. Yeah. And not a point. Otherwise, they're just modifications in how I define things. Um, right, the third one is the interesting one. All right, so these are both strong sort of geometric properties of the subgroup. The third one is just going to be the local property. It's H is purely loxodromic, right, which recall, it, it be phrased algebraically, every non-identity element has cyclic centralizer. So the three implies one is sort of this local to global property that I mentioned, right? It's just you need the element-wise condition. Okay. Okay, so I have like three minutes left. So rather than maybe just try to actually tell you a bit about the proof, um, I'll, I'll just, you know, in the remaining couple of minutes, I'll, I'll tell you maybe why I was originally interested in this question or sort of where this came up. So, um, so really it has to do with, with this connection. So in particular, I, th I think there, when I first started thinking about this idea of stability in random angle learning groups goes back to a discussion I had with, with Chris and Spencer and Johanna a couple of years ago about trying to understand this question in, in the mapping class group situation. So in the mapping class group situation, remember the question is, if you have a purely Sidoronosov subgroup of the mapping class group, is it convex co-compact? Okay. Well, so suppose, so the question is, can you find a counterexample coming from a right angle learning group? So um, Chris and Matt Clay and Johanna had these constructions of, this construction of putting right angle learning groups into mapping class groups. Okay. And the point is that if pH is purely Sidoronosov, then H is purely loxodromic. The point is if your, your image is Sidoronosov, then your centralizer in the mapping class group is virtually cyclic. Right? So your centralizer in the right angle Arden group can't be any more than cyclic. So the question is, can we find purely loxodromic subgroups of right angle Arden groups um, such that they are distorted in the right angle Arden group? What that would allow us to do is if we could find such a map, we map having a, a little bit more restrictive properties, more restrictive properties, we'd be able to put that subgroup in the mapping class group so that its image is purely Sidoronosov but distorted and hence not convex co-compact. However, the, the theorem itself says that can't happen. So the point is, if H is purely loxodromic, right, well, then by the theorem, that implies that H is stable in the right angle. Right? And in particular, H is quasi-convex and undistorted. Um, at the beginning, I find this, uh, this is somewhat of a surprising fact. The point is there are lots and lots of constructions of distorted free groups inside of right angle iron groups. There's lots of ways of constructing distorted free groups in right angle iron groups. And what our theorem says is any way you construct a distorted free group inside of a right angle iron group has to have elements with large centralizer. 
Okay, so, so I'll end there. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. So why are you calling it stable? How is the hyperbolically convex? Hyperbolically convex. <laughs> so the, the term stability goes, I mean, goes back to the st stability of quasi-geodesics in a hyperbolic group. So more elements are often called stable. And so there's a theorem called the stability of quasi-geodesics that tell you that geodesics have to fellow travel quasi-geodesics. I don't know. I don't know. I didn't. I didn't originally call the theorem stability of quasi-geodesics. I think it's a, a notion that goes back to like Mostow, right? And the proof of like Mostow rigidity. I don't know. Okay. Uh, so in the I like it better than calling them Morse. Other people said I should call them Morse, yeah. and I don't, I don't like that. That's. I think that's less. I like stability. <laughs> so in the outer band case, uh, uh, any of the implications between stable and stable, you know, non disclosed. Yeah. So I'll t I'll tell you the conjecture in there. So the conjecture, I'll just tell you, the conjecture in the out of n cases, um, you are stable if your orbit map into the free factor complex is a quasi-asymmetric embedding. Um, so the, the, there's neither of those directions, it's, that's an if and only if, neither of those directions is known, except what, what Spencer and I do in, in our proof, um, um, in our paper on hyperbolic extensions, is we prove that if you have a subgroup of out of n, whose orbit map into the free factor complex is quasi-asymmetric, then the orbit in outer space has the stability property. So it's some sort of partial direction to, from partial result well, to prove one of those directions. My implication is more to the conjecture. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't even know, you know, I don't even know. Yeah, I think it's not even known what are the Morse elements. I think even in a cyclic case, it's not known. What are the Morse elements of out of n? Certainly the Fully irreducible elements are Morse, but I don't know if other elements can be Morse as well. Other questions? Okay, now uh, let's thank Ben again. Thank you, guys. Thank you.